came upon the midnight clear that glorious song of old from angels bending near the earth to touch the hearts of gold his son the earth good will to men from hands all oh gracious king the world in solemn stillness lay to hear the angels sing hello and welcome to day Still nine the of the craftlet christmas extravaganza if you're just tuning in, we have eight days of fabulous Christmas audio, all family-friendly, all free, available to you at craftlit.com or at our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash craftlit-channel. Well, I have a little bit of a surprise for you. Today and for the next two days, we will feature stories from Lucy Maud Montgomery. You may know her name. She was born in 1874, and she died in 1942, and she is best known as L. M. Montgomery, who wrote the Anne of Green Gables books. Now, for those of you who have not been introduced to Anne of Green Gables, she a young orphan girl who is living in Nova Scotia, and then Montgomery she went and wrote a bunch of sequels to that book, but then she wrote 20 novels more, and at least 500 short stories and poems. And so we're going to hear some of the short stories over the next couple of days. And these all take place on Prince Edward Island. And if you ever want to travel there, <laughs> you can. This is all now preserved for you to go see. And I know lots of Craftlet listeners have been there and done that. But this is the first time that we are going to be listening to anything by Lucy Maud Montgomery on the podcast. So I'm really excited to be able to share this with you. And I don't think we need any more introduction than that. We are at the turn of the previous century. We are focusing on our little community in Prince Edward Island. If you don't know anything about it, trust me, you'll catch up to speed very quickly. And today and over the next couple of days, we'll have several Christmas stories from Ms. Montgomery for you. So without waiting any longer, here we go with our first story, A Christmas Mistake. Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1896-1901, to 1901, by Lucy Maud Montgomery, A Christmas Inspiration. Well, I really think Santa Claus has been very good to us all, said Jean Lawrence, pulling the pins out of her heavy coil of fair hair and letting it ripple over her shoulders. So do I, said Nellie Preston, as well as she could with a mouthful of chocolates. Those blessed home folks of mine seem to have divined by instinct the very things I most wanted. It was the dusk of Christmas Eve, and they were all in Jean Lawrence's room at number 16 Chestnut Terrace. Number 16 was a boarding house, and boarding houses are not proverbially cheerful places in which to spend Christmas, but Jean's room, at least, was a pleasant spot, and all the girls had brought their Christmas presents in to show each other. Christmas came on Sunday that year, and the Saturday evening mail at Chestnut Terrace had been an exciting one. Jean had lighted the pink-globed lamp on her table, and the mellow light fell over merry faces as the girls chatted about their gifts. On the table was a big white box heaped with roses that betokened a bit of Christmas extravagance on somebody's part. Jean's brother had sent them to her from Montreal, and all the girls were enjoying them in common. Number 16 Chestnut Terrace was overrun with girls generally, but just now only five were left. All the others had gone home for Christmas, but these five could not go and were bent on making the best of it. Belle and Olive Reynolds, who were sitting on the bed, Jean could never keep them off of it, were high school girls. They were said to be always laughing, and even the fact that they could not go home for Christmas because a young brother had measles did not dampen their spirits. Beth Hamilton, who was hovering over the roses, and Nellie Peterson, who was eating candy, were art students, and their homes were too far away to visit. As for Jean Lawrence, she was an orphan and had no home of her own. She worked on the staff of one of the big city newspapers, and the other girls were a little in awe of her cleverness, but her nature was a chummy one, and her room was a favorite rendezvous. Everybody liked frank, open-handed, and hearted Jean. It was so funny to see the postman when he came this evening, said Olive. He just bulged with parcels. They were sticking out in every direction. 
"'We all got our share of them,' said Jean with a sigh of contentment. "'Even the cook got six. I counted.' "'Miss Ellen didn't get a thing, not even a letter,' said Beth quickly. "'Beth had a trick of seeing things that the other girls didn't. "'I forgot, Miss Ellen. No, I don't believe she did,' answered Jean thoughtfully, "'as she twisted up her pretty hair. "'How dismal it must be to be so forlorn as that on Christmas Eve of old times. "'Ugh, I'm so glad I have friends.' "'I saw Miss Ellen watching us as we opened our parcels and letters,' Beth went on. I happened to look up once, and such an expression as was on her face, girls. It was pathetic and sad and envious all at once. It really made me feel bad. For five minutes, she concluded honestly. Hasn't Miss Allen any friends at all? asked Beth. No, I don't think she has, answered Jean. She has lived here for fourteen years, so Mrs. Pickerel says. Think of that, girls, fourteen years at Chestnut Terrace. "'Is it any wonder that she's thin and dried up and snappy?' "'Nobody ever comes to see her, and she never goes anywhere,' said Beth. "'Dear me, she must feel lonely now, when everyone else is being remembered by their friends. "'I can't forget her face tonight. It actually haunts me. "'Girls, how would you feel if you hadn't anyone belonging to you, "'and if nobody thought about you at Christmas?' "'Ow!' said Olive, as if the mere idea made her shiver." A little silence followed. To tell the truth, none of them liked Miss Allen. They knew that she did not like them either, but considered them frivolous and pert and complained when they made a racket. The skeleton at the face, Jean called her, and certainly the presence of the pale, silent, discontented-looking woman at number 16 table did not tend to heighten its festivity. Presently, Jean said with a dramatic flourish, "'Girls, I have an inspiration, a Christmas inspiration.' "'What is it?' cried four voices. "'Just this. Let us give Miss Allen a Christmas surprise. "'She's not received a single present, and I'm sure she feels lonely. "'Just think how we would feel if we were in her place.' "'That is true,' said Olive thoughtfully. "'Do you know, girls, this evening I went to her room with a message from Miss Pickerel, "'and I do believe she'd been crying. "'Her room looked dreadfully bare and cheerless, too. "'I think she's very poor.' "'What are we to do, Jean?' "'Let us each give her something nice. "'We can put the things just outside of her door "'so that she'll see them whenever she opens it. "'I'll give her some of Fred's roses, too, "'and I'll write a Christmassy letter in my very best style to go with them,' "'said Jean, warming up to her ideas as she talked. "'The other girls caught her spirit and entered into the plan with enthusiasm. "'Splendid!' cried Beth. "'Jean, it's an inspiration, sure enough.' "'Haven't we been horribly selfish, thinking of nothing but our own gifts and fun and pleasure? "'I really feel ashamed.' "'Let us do up the thing the very best way we can,' said Nellie, "'forgetting even her beloved chocolates in her eagerness. "'The shops are open yet. Let us go uptown and invest.' Five minutes later, five captain-jacketed figures were scurrying up the street "'in the frosty, starlit December dusk. "'Miss Allen, in her cold little room, heard their gay voices and sighed. She was crying by herself in the dark. It was Christmas for everybody but her, she thought drearily. In an hour the girls came back with their purchases. "'Now let's hold a council of war,' said Jean jubilantly. "'I hadn't the faintest idea what Miss Allen would like, so I just guessed wildly. "'I got her a lace handkerchief and a big bottle of perfume and a painted photograph frame, "'and I'll stick my own photo in it for fun. "'That was all I really could afford.' Christmas purchases have left my purse dreadfully lean. I got her a glove box and a pin tray, said Belle, and Olive got her a calendar and Whittier's poems, and besides, we're going to give her half of that big plummy fruit cake Mother sent us from home. I'm sure she hasn't tasted anything so delicious for years, for fruit cakes don't grow on Chestnut Terrace, and she never goes anywhere else for a meal. Beth had bought a pretty cup and saucer, and said she meant to give one of her pretty watercolors, too. Nellie, true to her reputation, had invested in a big box of chocolate creams, a gorgeously striped candy cane, a bag of oranges, and a brilliant lampshade of rose-colored crepe paper to top off with. "'It makes such a lot of show for the money,' she explained. "'I'm bankrupt, like Jean.' "'Well, we've got a lot of pretty things,' said Jean, in a tone of satisfaction." Now we must do them up nicely. 
Will you wrap them in tissue paper, girls, and tie them with baby ribbon? Here's a box of it, while I write that letter. While the others chatted over their parcels, Jean wrote her letter, and Jean could write delightful letters. She had a decided talent in that respect, and her correspondents all declared her letters to be things of beauty and joy forever. She put her best into Miss Allen's Christmas letter. Since then, she's written many bright and clever things, but I do not believe she's ever in her life wrote anything more genuinely original and delightful than that letter. Besides, it breathed the very spirit of Christmas, and all the girls declared that it was splendid. You must all sign it now, said Jean, and I'll put it in one of those big envelopes. And Nellie, won't you write her name on it in fancy letters? Which Nellie proceeded to do, and furthermore embellished the envelope by a border of chubby cherubs dancing hand in hand around it, and a sketch of number 16 Chestnut Terrace in the corner in lieu of a stamp. Not content with this, she hunted out a huge sheet of drawing paper and drew upon it an original pen and ink design after her own heart, a dudish cat. Miss Allen was fond of the number 16 cat, if she could be said to be fond of anything, was portrayed seated on a rocker arrayed in smoking jacket and cap, with a cigar waved airily aloft in one paw while the other held out a placard bearing the legend, Merry Christmas. A second cat in full street costume bowed politely, hat in paw, and waved a banner inscribed with Happy New Year, while faintly suggested kittens gambled around the border. The girls laughed until they cried over it, and voted it to be the best thing Nellie had yet done in original work. All this had taken time, and it was past eleven o'clock. Miss Allen had cried herself to sleep long ago, and everybody else in Chestnut Terrace was abed, when five figures cautiously crept down the hall, headed by Jean with a dim lamp. Outside of Miss Allen's door, the procession halted, and the girls silently arranged their gifts on the floor. "'That's done,' whispered Jean, in a tone of satisfaction, as they tipped back. "'And now let us go to bed, or Miss Pickerel, bless her heart, will be down on us for burning so much midnight oil. Oil has gone up, you know, girls.' It was in the early morning that Miss Allen opened her door. But early as it was, another door down the hall was half open, too, and five rosy faces were peering cautiously out. The girls had been up for an hour for fear they would miss the sight, and were all in Nellie's room, which commanded a view of Miss Allen's door. That lady's face was a study. Amazement, incredulity, wonder chased each other over it, succeeded by a glow of pleasure. On the floor before her was a snug little pyramid of parcels, topped by Jean's letter. On a chair behind it was a bowl of delicious hothouse roses and Nellie's placard. Miss Allen looked down the hall, but saw nothing, for Jean had slammed the door just in time. Half an hour later, when they were going down to breakfast, Miss Allen came along down the hall with outstretched hands to meet them. She had been crying again, but I think her tears were happy ones, and she was smiling now. A cluster of Jean's roses were pinned on her breast. "'Oh, girls, girls,' she said, with a tremble in her voice, "'I can never thank you enough. It was so kind and sweet of you. You don't know how much good you've done me.'" Breakfast was an unusually cheerful affair at number 16 that morning. There was no skeleton at the feast, and everybody was beaming. Miss Allen laughed and talked like a girl herself. "'Oh, how surprised I was,' she said. "'The roses were a bit like summer, and those cats of Nellie's were so funny and delightful. And your letter, too, Jean. I cried and laughed over it. I shall read it every day for a year.' After breakfast, everyone went to Christmas service. The girls went uptown to the church they attended. The city was very beautiful in the morning sunshine. There had been a white frost in the night, and the tree-lined avenues and public squares seemed like glimpses of fairyland. "'How lovely the world is,' said Jean. "'It really is the very happiest Christmas morning I've ever known,' declared Nellie. "'I never felt so really Christmassy in my inmost soul before.' "'I suppose,' said Beth thoughtfully, that it is because we've discovered for ourselves the old truth that it's more blessed to give than to receive. I've always known it in a way, but I never realized it before. Blessing on Jean's Christmas inspiration, said Nellie. But girls, let us try to make it an all-the-year-round inspiration, I say. We can bring a little bit of our own sunshine into Miss Allen's life as long as we live with her. Amen to that, said Jean heartily. Oh, listen, girls, the Christmas chimes. 
and all over the beautiful city was wafted the grand old message of peace on earth and goodwill to all the world. End of Christmas Inspiration Recording by Darcia Douglas Lucy Maud Montgomery Short Stories, 1896-1901 to By Lucy Maud Montgomery A Christmas Mistake Tomorrow is Christmas, announced Teddy Grant exultantly as he sat on the floor struggling manfully with a refractory bootlace that was knotted and tagless and stubbornly refused to go into the eyelets of Teddy's patched boots. Ain't I glad, though? Hurrah! His mother was washing the breakfast dishes in a dreary, listless sort of way. She looked tired and down-spirited. Ted's enthusiasm seemed to grate on her, for she answered sharply, "'Christmas, indeed! I can't see that it is anything to rejoice over. Other people may be glad enough, but what with winter coming on, I'd sooner it was spring than Christmas. Mary Alice, do lift that child out of the ashes and put its shoes and stockings on. Everything seems to be at sixes and sevens here this morning. Keith, the oldest boy, was coiled up on the sofa, calmly working out some algebra problems, quite oblivious to the noise around him. But he looked up from his slate, with his pencil suspended above an obstinate equation, to declaim with a flourish. Christmas comes but once a year, and then mother wishes it wasn't here. I don't, then, said Gordon, son number two, who was preparing his own noon lunch of bread and molasses at the table, and making an atrocious mess of crumbs and sugary syrup over everything. I know one thing to be thankful for, and that is that there'll be no school. We'll have a whole week of holidays. Gordon was noted for his aversion to school and his affection for holidays. And we're going to have turkey for dinner, declared Teddy, getting up off the floor and rushing to secure his share of bread and molasses. And cranberry sauce and, and pound cake, ain't we, Ma? No, you are not, said Mrs. Grant desperately, dropping the dishcloth and snatching the baby on her knee to wipe the crust of cinders and molasses from the chubby pink and white face. You may as well know it now, children. I've kept it from you so far in hopes that something would turn up, but nothing has. We can't have any Christmas dinner tomorrow. We can't afford it. I've pinched and saved every way I could for the last month, hoping that I'd be able to get a turkey for you anyhow. But you'll have to do without it. There's that doctor's bill to pay, and a dozen other bills coming in. And people say they can't wait. I suppose they can't, but it's kind of hard, I must say. The little Grants stood with open mouths and horrified eyes. No turkey for Christmas. Was the world coming to an end? Wouldn't the government interfere if anyone ventured to dispense with a Christmas celebration? The gluttonous Teddy stuffed his fists into his eyes and lifted up his voice. Keith, who understood better than the others the look on his mother's face, took his blubbering young brother by the collar and marched him into the porch. The twins, seeing the summary proceeding, swallowed the outcries they had intended to make, although they couldn't keep a few big tears from running down their fat cheeks. Mrs. Grant looked pityingly at the disappointed faces about her. Don't cry, children, you make me feel worse. We are not the only ones who will have to do without a Christmas turkey. We ought to be very thankful that we have anything to eat at all. I hate to disappoint you, but it can't be helped. Never mind, mother said Keith comfortingly, relaxing his hold upon the porch door, whereupon it suddenly flew open and precipitated Teddy, who had been tugging at the handle, heels over head backwards. We know you've done your best. It's been a hard year for you. Just wait, though. I'll soon be grown up, and then you and these greedy youngsters shall feast on turkey every day of the year. Hello, Teddy. Have you got on your feet again? Mind, sir, no more blubbering. When I'm a man, announced Teddy with dignity, I'd just like to see you put me in the porch, and I mean to have turkey all the time, and I won't give you any either. All right, you greedy small boy, only take yourself off to school now and let us hear no more squeaks out of you. 
Tramp, all of you, and give mother a chance to get her work done. Mrs. Grant got up and fell to work at her dishes with a brighter face. Well, we mustn't give in. Perhaps things will be better after a while. I'll make a famous bread pudding, and you can boil some molasses taffy and ask those little Smithsons next door to help you pull it. They won't whine for turkey, I'll be bound. I don't suppose they ever tasted such a thing in all their lives. If I could afford it, I'd have had all of them in to dinner with us. That sermon Mr. Evans preached last Sunday kind of stirred me up. He said we ought always to try to share our Christmas joy with some poor souls who had never learned the meaning of the word. I can't do as much as I'd like to. It was different when your father was alive. The noisy group grew silent as they always did when their father was spoken of. He had died the year before, and since his death the little family had had a hard time. Keith, to hide his feelings, began to hector the rest. Mary Alice, do hurry up. Here, you twin nuisances, get off to school. If you don't, you'll be late and then the master will give you a whipping. He won't, answered the irrepressible Teddy. He never whips us. He doesn't. He stands us on the floor sometimes, though, he added, remembering the many times his own chubby legs had been seen to better advantage on the school platform. That man, said Mrs. Grant, alluding to the teacher, makes me nervous. He is the most abstracted creature I ever saw in my life. It is a wonder to me he doesn't walk straight into the river some day. You'll meet him meandering along the street, gazing into vacancy, and he'll never see you nor hear a word you say half the time. Yesterday, said Gordon, chuckling over the remembrance, he came in with a big piece of paper he'd picked up on the entry floor in one hand and his hat in the other, and he stuffed his hat into the coal scuttle and hung up the paper on a nail as grave as you please. Never knew the difference till Ned Slocum went and told him. He's always doing things like that. Keith had collected his books and now marched his brothers and sisters off to school. Left alone with the baby, Mrs. Grant betook herself to her work with a heavy heart. But a second interruption broke the progress of her dishwashing. I declare, she said with a surprised glance through the window, if there isn't that absent-minded school teacher coming through the yard, what can he want? Dear me, I do hope Teddy hasn't been cutting capers in school again. For the teacher's last call had been in October, and had been occasioned by the fact that the irrepressible Teddy would persist in going to school with his pockets filled with live crickets, and in driving them harnessed to strings up and down the aisle when the teacher's back was turned. All mild methods of punishment having failed, the teacher had called to talk it over with Mrs. Grant, with the happy result that Teddy's behavior had improved, in the matter of crickets at least. But it was about time for another outbreak. Teddy had been unnaturally good for too long a time. Poor Mrs. Grant feared that it was the calm before a storm, and it was with nervous haste that she went to the door and greeted the young teacher. He was a slight, pale, boyish-looking fellow, with an abstracted, musing look in his large, dark eyes. Mrs. Grant noticed with amusement that he wore a white straw hat in spite of the season. His eyes were directed to her face with his usual unseeing gaze. "'Just as though he was looking through me at something a thousand miles away,' said Mrs. Grant afterwards. "'I believe he was, too.' His body was right there on the step before me, but where his soul was is more than you or I or anybody can tell. Good morning, he said absently. I have just called on my way to school with a message from Mrs. Miller. She wants you all to come up and have Christmas dinner with her tomorrow. For the land's sake, said Mrs. Grant blankly, I don't understand. To herself she thought, I wish I dared take him and shake him, to find if he's walking in his sleep or not. You and all the children, every one, went on the teacher dreamily, as if he were reciting a lesson learned beforehand. She told me to tell you to be sure and come. Shall I say that you will? Oh, yes, that is, I suppose, I don't know, said Mrs. Grant incoherently. I never expected, yes, you may tell her we'll come. 
she concluded abruptly. Thank you, said the abstracted messenger, gravely lifting his hat and looking squarely through Mrs. Grant into unknown regions. When he had gone, Mrs. Grant went in and sat down, laughing in a sort of hysterical way. I wonder if it is all right. Could Cornelia really have told him? She must, I suppose, but it is enough to take one's breath. Mrs. Grant and Cornelia Miller were cousins, and had once been the closest of friends, but that was years ago, before some spiteful reports and ill-natured gossip had come between them, making only a little rift at first that soon widened into a chasm of coldness and alienation. Therefore this invitation surprised Mrs. Grant greatly. Miss Cornelia was a maiden lady of certain years, with a comfortable bank account and a handsome, old-fashioned house on the hill behind the village. She always boarded the school teachers and looked after them maternally. She was an active church worker and a tower of strength to struggling ministers and their families. If Cornelia has seen fit at last to hold out the hand of reconciliation, I'm glad enough to take it. Dear knows, I've wanted to make up often enough, but I didn't think she ever would. We've both of us got too much pride and stubbornness. It's the Turner blood in us that does it. The Turners were all so set. But I mean to do my part now she has done hers. And Mrs. Grant made a final attack on the dishes with a beaming face. When the little Grants came home and heard the news, Teddy stood on his head to express his delight. The twins kissed each other, and Mary Alice and Gordon danced around the kitchen. Keith thought himself too big to betray any joy over a Christmas dinner, but he whistled while doing the chores until the bare welkin in the yard rang, and Teddy, in spite of unheard-of misdemeanors, was not collared off into the porch once. When the young teacher got home from school that evening, he found the yellow house full of all sorts of delectable odors. Miss Cornelia herself was concocting mince pies after the famous family recipe, while her ancient and faithful handmaiden, Hannah, was straining into molds the cranberry jelly. The open pantry door revealed a tempting array of Christmas delicacies. "'Did you call and invite the Smithsons up to dinner as I told you?' asked Miss Cornelia anxiously. "'Yes,' was the dreamy response as he glided through the kitchen and vanished into the hall. Miss Cornelia crimped the edges of her pies delicately with a relieved air. I made certain he'd forget it, she said. You just have to watch him as if he were a mere child. Didn't I catch him yesterday starting off to school in his carpet slippers? And in spite of me, he got away today in that ridiculous summer hat. You'd better set that jelly in the out pantry to cool, Hannah. It looks good. We'll give those poor little Smithsons a feast for once in their lives if they never get another. At this juncture, the hall door flew open, and Mr. Palmer appeared on the threshold. He seemed considerably agitated, and for once his eyes had lost their look of space-searching. "'Miss Miller, I am afraid I did make a mistake this morning. It has just dawned on me. I am almost sure that I called at Mrs. Grant's and invited her and her family instead of the Smithsons, and she said they would come. Miss Cornelia's face was a study. Mr. Palmer, she said, flourishing her crimping fork tragically, do you mean to say you went and invited Linda Grant here tomorrow? Linda Grant of all the women in this world. I did, said the teacher with penitent wretchedness. It was very careless of me. I am very sorry. What can I do? I'll go down and tell them I made a mistake if you like. You can't do that, groaned Miss Cornelia, sitting down and wrinkling up her forehead in dire perplexity. It would never do in the world. For pity's sake, let me think for a minute. Miss Cornelia did think, to good purpose evidently, for her forehead smoothed out as her meditations proceeded, and her face brightened. Then she got up briskly. Well, you've done it, and no mistake. I don't know that I'm sorry, either. Anyhow, we'll leave it as it is. But you must go straight down now and invite the Smithsons, too. And for pity's sake, don't make any more mistakes. When he had gone, Miss Cornelia opened her heart to Hannah. 
I never could have done it myself, never. The Turner is too strong in me. But I'm glad it's done. I've been wanting for years to make up with Linda. And now the chance has come, thanks to that blessed blundering boy, I mean to make the most of it. Mind, Hannah, you never whisper a word about its being a mistake. Linda must never know. Poor Linda, she's had a hard time. Hannah, we must make some more pies, and I must go straight down to the store and get some more Santa Claus stuff. I've only got enough to go around the Smithsons. When Mrs. Grant and her family arrived at the yellow house next morning, Miss Cornelia herself ran out bareheaded to meet them. The two women shook hands a little stiffly, and then a rill of long-repressed affection trickled out from some secret spring in Miss Cornelia's heart, and she kissed her new-found old friend tenderly. Linda returned the kiss warmly, and both felt that the old-time friendship was theirs again. The little Smithsons all came, and they and the little Grants sat down on the long bright dining-room to a dinner that made history in their small lives, and was eaten over again in happy dreams for months. How those children did eat! And how beaming Miss Cornelia and grim-faced, soft-hearted Hannah, and even the absent-minded teacher himself, enjoyed watching them! After dinner, Miss Cornelia distributed among the delighted little souls the presents she had bought for them, and then turned them loose in the big shining kitchen to have a taffy pull, and they had it to their heart's content. And as for the shocking, taffified state into which they got their own rosy faces and that once immaculate domain, well, as Miss Cornelia and Hannah never said one word about it, neither will I. The four women enjoyed the afternoon in their own way, and the school teacher buried himself in algebra to his own great satisfaction. When her guests went home in the starlit December dusk, Miss Cornelia walked part of the way with them and had a long confidential talk with Mrs. Grant. When she returned, it was to find Hannah groaning in and over the kitchen, and the school teacher dreamily trying to clean some molasses off his boots with the kitchen hairbrush. Long-suffering Miss Cornelia rescued her property and dispatched Mr. Palmer into the woodshed to find the shoe brush. Then she sat down and laughed. Hannah, what will become of that boy yet? There's no counting on what he'll do next. I don't know how he'll ever get through the world, I'm sure, but I'll look after him while he's here at least. I owe him a huge debt of gratitude for this Christmas blunder. What an awful mess this place is in. But Hannah, did you ever in the world see anything so delightful as that little Tommy Smithson stuffing himself with plum cake, not to mention Teddy Grant? It did me good just to see them. End of A Christmas Mistake Recording by Trisha G. Beneath life's cry
rushing load whose forms are bending low who toil along the climbing way with painful steps and slow look now for glad and golden hours come swiftly on the wing oh rest beside the End of song. This recording is in the public domain.